Could this be the reason I don't feel balanced? Why is the brain so affected by toxins? The brain works off of chemistry. To feel happy, the brain expresses a chemical. To feel love, the brain expresses a chemical. To suppress anger, the brain uses a chemical. If you change the chemistry, you change the function. And that is what a toxin does. It alters normal physiological function so that it is no longer normal. Carbon monoxide poisoning. For example, if a fellow is in a sealed garage with the car running, he will become toxified by the carbon monoxide. This is how that occurs. Hemoglobin on the red blood cell is what carries oxygen. We breathe in oxygen and it then gets bound to the red blood cells at the lungs. As the blood flows out from the lungs to the body, it carries oxygen to the cells, the tissues, and the brain. This is how we breathe and how we survive. When there is carbon monoxide present, the carbon monoxide binds to the hemoglobin instead of the oxygen. This occurs even though there is still plenty of oxygen available to the red blood cell. And when the carbon monoxide bound to the red blood cell reaches the tissues, the carbon monoxide will not release. Even adding more oxygen to the room would not save the person. There was plenty of oxygen in the room already, and he just can't use it. The only remedy is to shut off the source of the carbon monoxide and open the garage door. This is similar for most toxic situations. Just adding more vitamins is usually insufficient. To get blocked neurochemical pathways to function normally, you have to get the toxins out for normal function to return. Pesticides. Another example is pesticides. Pesticides kill a pest by knocking out its nervous system. We use some of the same neurochemicals as grasshoppers, specifically acetylcholine, abbreviated ACH. Acetylcholine is an excitatory neurochemical when the grasshopper leg is called to kick. Acetylcholine is released in the nervous system, opens up channels at the synapse, and then the leg kicks. The channel that opened to allow this then closes. The flow of acetylcholine stops, and the leg stops kicking. The pesticide makes it so that the channel stays open, and the flow of acetylcholine does not stop, and the insect becomes overstimulated and dies and the pesticides do the same thing to us to some degree once they have accumulated in our body. In pesticide poisoning, the channels stay stuck open. This is called excitotoxic poisoning. We will now watch a full video on pesticide poisoning. Insecticides destroy the central nervous system by affecting three molecular targets. The enzyme acetylcholinesterase, acetylcholine receptors of the synaptic sodium channels, and axonal sodium channels. 
First, we will discuss the organophosphate and carbamate insecticides that inhibit acetylcholinesterase. Acetylcholinesterase acts in association with synaptic sodium channels. The channel consists of five proteins. Two of the five proteins are identical and have acetylcholine receptors. When acetylcholine, released by the presynaptic neuron, binds to the two receptors, it activates the channel to open. The activated channel opens and sodium ions flow through the channel and into the cell. When the acetylcholine comes off the channel receptors, the channel closes. This stops the sodium flow into the channel. Acetylcholinesterase breaks the acetylcholine molecule to keep acetylcholine from continuing to stimulate the sodium channel receptors and reopening the channel. During organophosphate and carbamate poisoning, the insecticide molecules bind to the active site of the acetylcholinesterase enzymes and block the enzymes from degrading the acetylcholine from the sodium channel receptors. This keeps the sodium channels open constantly. Let us see what happens when this occurs in the synapse. The insecticide enters the synapse of poisoned insects and blocks acetylcholinesterase. The sodium channels open in response to release of acetylcholine by the presynaptic neuron. The insecticide binds the acetylcholinesterase and the enzyme can no longer destroy acetylcholine. The accumulating acetylcholine constantly stimulates the sodium channel receptors and keeps the channels open so that sodium flows into the postsynaptic neuron and produces uncontrolled firing of nerve impulses. The uncontrolled nerve firing results in the twitching of the limbs that we observe in organophosphate and carbamate poisoned insects. We will next discuss how insecticides interact with the enzymes, receptors, and channels of neurons to disrupt nervous system functions. How this type of poisoning shows up in humans is anxiety that is with them most of the time, unless they are heavily medicated. The accumulation of neurotoxic pesticide burden disables our nervous system's ability to regulate itself. These symptoms usually are treated with medications. And very little attention is given to the mechanisms that created the problem. Some people can tolerate pesticide exposure better than others. Humans have enzymes in the liver that assist in breaking down pesticides. Biotransformation Pesticides are fat-soluble toxins, and just like fat, these toxins must be biotransformed into a water-soluble form so that we can expel it. Genetically, some people produce more of these specific enzymes needed to achieve this. Some people produce none at all and are the most affected. But we all suffer to some degree from this exposure as fat-soluble toxins deposit themselves in the brain and organs. Fat-soluble toxins also accumulate in the cell membrane of every cell in the body. Where are we getting exposed to pesticides? Most of us think when we have a salad, a spinach smoothie, a basket of blueberries, or even visiting a farmer's market that we are being healthy. Very likely, if not organic, that salad is more toxic to our system than a deep-fried Twinkie. Any food item that the pesticide comes in contact with the part we are going to ingest will impart that toxicity to us. And since the toxin is waxy and fat soluble, it won't wash off the fruit or vegetable. And it accumulates in the body over a lifetime, forming what is called a toxic burden. The best option is to buy organic. Where we spend our dollars 
is like voting. It determines who is going to be in power and who is not. Supporting organic foods means that we will start seeing more organic on our shelves. Organic food identification stickers start with a 9. Any other number is not organic. And not everything you buy at natural or whole food stores is organic. The terms whole and natural are not always synonymous with healthy. These type of marketing ploys often include non-organic and therefore toxic food items cleverly disguised as being healthy. So please insist on only organic. According to the Environmental Working Group, certain types of organic produce can reduce the amount of toxins you consume by 80 percent. When organic is not possible, there are some reasonably acceptable items that are not organic. This is usually due to the outside covering of the item being removed before eating. The Clean Dozen These items show little or no toxins in a non-organic form. Onions avocados, sweet corn, pineapples, mango, sweet peas, asparagus, kiwi fruit, cabbage, eggplant, cantaloupe, watermelon, grapefruit, sweet potatoes, sweet onions. And then there is the dirty dozen, celery, peaches, strawberries, apples, domestic blueberries, nectarines, peppers, spinach, collard greens and kale, cherries, potatoes, imported grapes, and lettuce. These items showed between 47 and 67 toxic chemicals. Eating these items non-organic is the equivalent of ingesting a chemical cocktail. Aspartame and MSG. Aspartame is most commonly found in gum and diet sodas. Aspartame is composed of aspartic acid, which is excitatory. MSG is found in many processed foods. MSG is composed of glutamate and glutamic acid, which are also excitatory. Too much aspartic acid or glutamate in the brain can kill certain neurons by allowing the influx of too much calcium into the cells. This influx is called excitotoxicity. Excitotoxins, just like pesticides, excite or stimulate the neural cells to death. Also, these additives can increase a person's weight because they poison energy metabolism. Mercury Mercury is the most toxic natural occurring substance on the planet. Anxiety, ruminations, and particularly insomnia are the most typical features we encounter with the mercury burden. We believe this is due to its impact on serotonin and melatonin synthesis. Also, mercury is neurotoxic to brain cells. The following video will demonstrate this feature. How Mercury Causes Brain Neuron Degeneration 
Mercury has long been known to be a potent neurotoxic substance, whether it is inhaled or consumed in the diet as a food contaminant. Over the past 15 years, medical research laboratories have established that dental amalgam tooth fillings are a major contributor to mercury body burden. In 1997, a team of research scientists demonstrated that mercury vapor inhalation by animals produced a molecular lesion in brain protein metabolism, which was similar to a lesion seen in 80% of Alzheimer diseased brains. Recently completed experiments by scientists at the University of Calgary's Faculty of Medicine now reveal, with direct visual evidence from brain neuron tissue cultures, how mercury ions actually alter the cell membrane structure of developing neurons. To better understand mercury's effect on the brain, let us first illustrate what brain neurons look like and how they grow. In this animation, we see three brain neurons growing in a tissue culture, each with a central cell body and numerous neurite processes. At the end of each neurite is a growth cone where structural proteins are assembled to form the cell membrane. Two principal proteins involved in growth cone function are actin, which is responsible for the pulsating motion seen here, and tubulin, a major structural component of the neurite membrane. During normal cell growth, tubulin molecules link together end to end to form microtubules which surround neurofibrils, another structural protein component of the neuronal axon. Shown here is the neurite of a live neuron isolated from snail brain tissue, displaying linear growth due to growth cone activity. It is important to note that growth cones in all animal species, ranging from snails to humans, have identical structural and behavioral characteristics and use proteins of virtually identical composition. In this experiment, neurons also isolated from snail brain tissue were grown in culture for several days, after which very low concentrations of mercury were added to the culture medium for 20 minutes. Over the next 30 minutes, the neurite membrane underwent rapid degeneration, leaving behind the denuded neurofibrils seen here. In contrast, other heavy metals added at this same concentration, such as aluminum, lead, cadmium, and manganese, did not produce this effect. To understand how mercury causes this degeneration, let us return to our illustration. As mentioned before, tubulin proteins link together during normal cell growth to form the microtubules which support the neurite structure. When mercury ions are introduced into the culture medium, they infiltrate the cell and bind themselves to newly synthesized tubulin molecules. More specifically, the mercury ions attach themselves to the binding site reserved for guanosine triphosphate, or GTP, on the beta subunit of the affected tubulin molecules. Since bound GTP normally provides the energy which allows tubulin molecules to attach to one another, mercury ions bound to these sites prevent tubulin proteins from linking together. Consequently, the neurite's microtubules begin to disassemble into free tubulin molecules, leaving the neurite stripped of its supporting structure. Ultimately, both the developing neurite and its growth cone collapse, and some denuded neurofibrils form aggregates or tangles, as depicted here. Shown here is a neurite growth cone stained specifically for tubulin and actin, before and after mercury exposure. Note that the mercury has caused disintegration of tubulin microtubule structure. These new findings reveal important visual evidence as to how mercury causes neurodegeneration. More importantly, this study provides the first direct evidence that low-level mercury exposure is indeed a precipitating factor that can initiate this neurodegenerative process within the brain. Compact fluorescent light bulbs have mercury in them. When they are broken, the mercury is released into the environment, particularly groundwater. The best energy saving light is an LED. Mercury fillings. The most toxic, natural, occurring substance on the planet put directly into your head? Really? The American Dental Association still tries to justify this practice. When you have your mercury fillings removed, please consult a holistic dentist. 
unskilled removal of these fillings can actually worsen a person's toxic burden and symptoms. Mercury accumulates in fish as they do not have the genetics to clear it. The half-life of mercury in a fish is two years. In us humans, it is one year. In a rat, it is one day. Half-life is the time required for the species to remove half of the mercury. Farm-raised fish are one of the most toxic foods you can eat. Like Scottish smoked salmon, for instance. You might be healthier eating rats that had lived off of deep-fried Twinkies. This is because farm-raised fish have bioaccumulated mercury. Bioaccumulation The farm-raised fish are fed ground-up pellets that are, in fact, ground-up fish that were also farmed-raised. The fish take in the mercury and cannot get rid of it. Then, they are fed to other fish who can't get rid of it either. The populations then amplify their mercury content rapidly. The labeling of organic fish only means that the toxic fish pellets were made from fish that could be sold to humans. It is still toxic. If you want to eat fish, only eat small fish that have not had enough time to accumulate a lot of mercury or medium-sized fish that were wild-caught. Wild-caught fish are much lower in mercury. Always avoid large fish like swordfish, especially while pregnant. Almost all sushi is made from farm-raised fish. As much as we all want to believe that sushi is healthy food, it is not. The mercury alone in the average sushi makes the impact on human physiology worse than donuts and greasy delivery pizza. Thimerosal is a mercury-containing preservative that has been used in vaccines and is still used in many influenza vaccines. And then we are practically forced to give this to our children? Really? The safety studies done by the CDC with thimerosal exclude those with autism genetics, which are the exact persons most likely to have the worst reactions. Often, rat studies are cited. And since rats have incredible detoxification genetics, they don't really represent how humans are affected. Molecular Mimicry One of the main reasons why metals are so toxic is that they mimic minerals. We are living in a mineral deficient society. The magnesium content of today's spinach is a 40th of what it was in the 30s. Our true Paleolithic diet, especially in the winter, was roots that we dug up out of the ground and ate, which were full of minerals. We drank out of creeks and bathed in waterfalls. Minerals and metals are positively charged ions. On a molecular level, they mimic each other. The tissues themselves cannot make a distinction between toxic metals and essential minerals. Just like a statically charged balloon cannot make the distinction between your hair, your sweater, or dust from the floor. And so when we are mineral deficient, we attract toxic metals that have serious consequences on our health, our mental state, our hormones, and our immune system. Candida and mold species can live in a mercury environment, but healthy gut bacteria cannot. Treating candida or mold without removing the mercury is often insufficient. Also, folks with Lyme disease 
very often have a mercury burden. It is likely that the immunotoxicity of mercury predisposes their immune system so that it becomes more vulnerable to Lyme. Mercury is believed to also poison serotonin and melatonin production. The precursor amino acid for serotonin is tryptophan. Tryptophan is derived from food. Tryptophan is converted to 5-HTP and then 5-HTP is converted to serotonin inside the brain. Serotonin can then convert to melatonin, the primary sleep neurohormone. Mercury may potentially block production of serotonin by impairing the adenization of methionine to make SAMe, which is needed for the conversion of tryptophan into serotonin and melatonin. A person low in brain level serotonin and melatonin will be an anxious and ruminating mess that will not even be able to find relief by sleeping. And since 90% of serotonin is produced by the gut, digestion is impacted as well. Taking melatonin is barely effective in this situation, as melatonin will have to be broken down into tryptophan to be able to cross the blood-brain barrier. And since the pathway is blocked, just like in carbon monoxide poisoning, adding more nutrients typically has little effect. The poison level has to be reduced so that supplementation can be effective. Arsenic. In another example, clinically, we have found high arsenic levels to be associated with a low endorphin type personality. Low endorphin persons tend to be very sensitive to physical pain and to others' emotions, so much so that they may resort to opiates or large amounts of alcohol to help block those emotions. So when we talk about neurotoxicity, we are talking about poisons that alter the way our neurochemicals are expressed or maintained. This imbalance in chemicals like serotonin, dopamine, endorphins, or GABA is what sets us up for an addictive biochemistry. An addictive biochemistry is when we crave drugs alcohol, or toxic foods because we are trying to self-medicate this imbalance. And the addictive biochemistry is often more powerful than our willpower to suppress it. Toxic metals such as mercury, arsenic, lead, antimony, aluminum, and radioactive metals are some of the most toxic environmental pollutants. And in the next video in the series, we will discuss the removal. Hormone Mimickers There are also hormonal toxins called hormone mimickers, or hormone disruptors. Ones that affect estrogen are called xenoestrogens. These include plastic softeners, like BPA, dioxins that accumulate in animal fatty tissue, phthalates in cleaning products, parabens in cosmetics and hygiene products, and hormones used in animal production and soy. These types of toxins are associated with sterility, uterine-type cancers, endometriosis, PMS, and in fact, every type of disease that disrupting the delicate balance of hormones would cause. Cosmetics are a common culprit here. Many toxins and hygiene products do not have to be labeled and can be flown under the generic term of fragrance. 
A resource for toxic components and hygiene products can be found at the website Skin Deep. We will pause the video to explore the website now. Immunotoxins and Autoimmune Disease Immunotoxins are toxins that poison the functioning of our immune defense system. This shuts off our ability to be able to fight off infections. Diseases like HIV and Lyme prey upon a weakened immune system. And that is what immunotoxins do. Immunotoxicity also pushes the immune system towards attacking itself, which is called autoimmune. Common examples of autoimmune disease are multiple sclerosis, celiac, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, and possibly fibromyalgia. When tissues become depositories for toxins, like PCBs from older electrical equipment that is still in the environment, mold toxins, dioxins from meat, or other immunotoxins, the immune system may determine that the tissues are no longer self and start attacking itself. Though autoimmune issues are known to be genetic, environmental factors can turn on these destructive genetic mechanisms. It is said that genetics points the gun in a certain direction, but the environment and lifestyle pulls the trigger. GMO foods. Though we could very likely modify foods in a positive way, such as increasing the vitamin A content of rice, most of the genetic modification of food is directed towards making it more capable of enduring toxic herbicides, such as glyphosate. This is called Roundup Ready. So we create food products that can survive toxic poisoning, and then we eat them. Think about that for a minute. In some cases, such as GMO corn, the toxin, called Bt toxin, is produced by the corn itself. Then, we eat the toxin. There is some theory that the bacteria in our gut picks up this Bt toxin, and then the bacteria in our gut self-produce it. Whoa, that is obnoxiously scary, right? 90% of Americans want labeling for GMO foods, and it still hasn't happened. Why? Because most Americans wouldn't eat it, and the GMO food industry would take a big hit. Jeffrey Smith wrote a great book about all this called Seeds of Deception. Conclusion In fact, in the modernized world, there is very little that is not toxic. The flame retardants in our beds, our water, and the bottles we drink from, the food we eat, the pan we cook our food in, coated with non-stick perfluorinated chemicals, the carpet in our home, the cleaning products we use, the mercury in our teeth and food. We are living, sleeping, eating, breathing, and working in a chemical soup. And some people have the genetics to better endure it, and some do not. According to the Center for Disease Control, the epidemic of epidemics in cardiovascular and immunological and neurological disease is likely associated with environmental toxins. What we are attempting to encourage you around is to view detoxification as a lifestyle just as exercise is a lifestyle. It is very important to our health, especially our mental health, 
that we are very vigilant about what we consume and how we can accelerate the removal of toxicants from our bodies. It is also important to arm ourselves with the knowledge regarding what our particular physiology can tolerate and what it cannot. In the next section, we will be discussing techniques to reduce toxic body burden.